Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video. Today on the channel we have Abby Sharp, dietitian Abby Sharp. I've done a video on her before, however it is a tier 3 Patreon exclusive actually because it is such an antiquated video. So if you want to get some very exclusive content, go ahead and subscribe over on that platform linked below in the description. The video in question today is the truth about what sugar does to the body. Weight gain, hormones, diabetes, oh my! So we're gonna go ahead and jump directly into this. We know that Abby Sharp doesn't understand a lick about sugar at all. Nutrition in general, actually. Okay, dietitians don't know anything about nutrition. The last person you should be taking nutrition advice from is actually Abby Sharp, dietitians. Now, second to that is nutritionists. The irony is not lost, but it is correct. Anyway, before we jump into this, of course, like I just said, please subscribe to the Patreon, and if you haven't already, to gain access to one week early uploads, ad-free content, uncensored content, and one extra video per week, as well as, of course, if you subscribe to Tier 3, all of the exclusive uploads, the antiquated videos of mine, and also buy my book, Contraindicated, if you have not already. And with that being said, now let's jump directly into this video. Can't wait. It's been called toxic, a silent killer, and straight up poison. Well, it is, in fact, actually. Whether you like that or not, but we'll get into it, of course. Has consistently, and in many cases exclusively, been blamed for the obesity epidemic along- Well, it shouldn't be exclusively blamed, but okay. Rising rates of deadly chronic disease. Yes, appropriately so, in fact. Is sugar actually the one to blame? The it's one of them, yes. It's one of the most salient ones, in fact, yes. Others might surprise you. Very quickly, a thank you to my colleague Eric Williamson, PhD and RD from Unlocked Fitness and Nutrition. Oh, uh, well, I better shut the f up then. Because PhD, right there. And RD. I didn't cover that in the beginning, did I? Goodness. Thanks. Thanks, Eric, for the propaganda we're going to hear in this video. Thank you. Nutrition coaching company that specializes in fitness and weight management. Oh, they specialize in it. Sharing some links to their website and content if you're looking for personalized support in your nutrition journey that I can endorse. Also, before we get into this video... Why would we ever want that? Why would anyone want that? Important controversial topic. A quick note from today's sponsor. Let me hop. Oh, goodness. Okay, so Google Sugar is bad, and you will get millions of listicles and blogs about how sugar and sugar alone is basically making you fat, old, or die young. Well, the. <laughs> It pretty much is, actually, if you know the physiology behind sugar in terms of how it reacts with the body. If you knew anything about metabolism, you know anything about biochemistry, you understand why, actually. But no, it should not be exclusively blamed, but it is one of the most salient things and factors. But also, if you Google sugar is good for you, you'll also find just as many articles. So what's your point? These claims are grounded in some evidence, but they generally- You wouldn't know what evidence truly is if it slapped you upside the chin, and we've seen that on multiple occasions on your channel, Abby. But they've generally been sensationalized and oversimplified to the point of having no real meaning at all. So Tell us all about oversimplification, Abby. Let me give you the hard truths and the specifics of how much you can eat to minimize your risk. Well, I don't think anybody except me is going to give any hard truths at all. But please, please, make an attempt. Make myself a little sweet treat. Fear number- Of course. We know where her stance is, if we didn't already. Fear number one, sugar causes a dangerous spike in blood sugar and insulin. So yes, uh, it's in the name blood sugar. The only way you're going to get a dangerous blood sugar spike is by consuming sugar. Okay. Really, when we say sugar spike, we mean glucose spike. Fructose is metabolized a little differently and doesn't even stimulate insulin, hardly at all, and it doesn't raise blood sugar levels, and therefore doesn't really impact your A1C, Paul Saladino. If you look at the fructosamine assay, you see very clearly that the fructose-fed group sees a rise in the fructosamine assay. But anyway, yeah, insulin is an anabolic hormone that raises one's propensity for storing fat. In fact, if you did not have insulin in your body, you wouldn't store onto anything you would waste away. Okay, we see this in type 1 diabetics. Go on then. Between very scary looking graphs on your For You page and the trend of influencers using continuous glucose monitors, there's a lot of buzz right now about blood sugars and insulin. But very quickly, a little physiology lesson here to explain. Tell us all about physiology, Abby. Tell us every single iota of relevant physiology to this discussion here. Go ahead. What all this means, when we consume a carbohydrate-containing food, and also protein to some extent, but we're going to keep it really super simple here, our body releases insulin to store that sugar in our liver, muscles, or in body fat, after which- No, 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 no. 
the body does not store sugar in adipocytes, in body fat. It stores body fat in body fat. It stores triglycerides, really. If you're talking about the transmutation of glucose into fatty acids, de novo lipogenesis, sure, yes. And also the transmutation of glucose into glycerol for those fatty acids, those newly formed fatty acids to form triglycerides, thus to be stored in adipocytes, yes. It does not store sugar in fat cells. No, it doesn't. In fact, it stores sugar in what you just said, glucose particularly, in muscles and liver, in the form of glycogen, sure. After which, our blood sugars will fall. This- Yes, they won't just simply fall, they will trough, well, excessively. It's called postprandial hypoglycemia, which stimulates one's appetite again to eat more carbohydrates, and then you have a roller coaster every single day. And eventually, the insulin released from the beta cells of the pancreas that you were just referring to on the islets of Langerhorn, they seem to fatigue. To the point where, well, you get type 2 diabetes because you're releasing insufficient insulin, and there's a reason that type 2 diabetes trends towards type 1. But anyway. Totally normal physiological process that helps supply our body with fuel and maintain blood sugar homeostasis. Okay, so there's a few things there. Okay, number one, yes, it is a way in which our body maintains glucose homeostasis because of the fact, precisely because of the fact, Abby, that glucose above the normal indicated physiological level is toxic, okay? What is the molecule that damages people with diabetes? What is the molecule inducing damage? Well, it's glucose via covalent binding mechanisms to proteins within the body, which destroys them. Actually, all aldehydes do this, and glucose is a six carbon aldehyde. Now, whether the reason why glucose is damaging is because of its aldehyde functional group and aldehyde nature? I don't know, but I find it very coincidental that glucose is an aldehyde and destroys lipid rafts, tears cell membranes to pieces, binds to DNA, and mutates it actively, or at least can cause mutations to it, and in high enough concentration can kill a cell outright, and aldehydes do the exact same things. Aldehydes are typically the result of lipid peroxidation products, but glucose itself is an aldehyde and does very similar things, so interesting coincidence there. But yes, it does in fact maintain glucose homeostasis. You also just said, however, that this is a normal physiological response. Yes, to a carbohydrate bolus. It is not a normal physiological response to have a blood sugar spike in the first place, though. No, it isn't. That was very, very seldomly experienced in history. Okay, so, so no. Your insinuation here, your implications are false. Sorry. Okay, the best way to maintain glucose homeostasis is by not consuming it. Of course, influencers without diabetes are interpreting literally any fluctuation in blood sugar as dangerous and disease-causing. So no, that's not true, in fact. That is hyperbolic. Okay. We're not saying that it is disease causing to have one blood sugar spike. We're saying doing it day after day after day, multiple times within the same day as well, is conducive to causing disease and inflammation. Chronic inflammation being, well, a cause of many diseases actually. At least a catalyst to raising the propensity for developing diseases. We should probably leave it at that, really. Okay. Because we know that inflammation is a pre-programmed response that occurs within the body when it has perceived damage to tissues or a potential invading pathogen. Glucose actually stimulates inflammation for both reasons. So, anyway. ...that we should basically fear perfectly nutritious whole sugar-containing foods. There's no such thing. That's an oxymoron. Okay. Well, I guess you could say it's not an oxymoron because things rich and replete with sugar, or at least teeming in it, are not necessarily bereft of nutrients. However, if you take cyanide, a non-lethal dose of it, and you cover it up with a bunch of biotin or vitamin B, well, it doesn't make the cyanide any less toxic, and it doesn't mean that that little concoction, that amalgam that you just made, is salubrious. Okay. Like fruit. And this fruit is not nutritious. Well, it's not indicated. I should say that. It's not indicated at all. Fiber, Abby. And this is incredibly short-sighted. For one... Tell us all about being short-sighted, Abby. Yes, you can, and you will, see a little blip in your blood sugar. Wh well, there you go. You must ask yourself, is that indicated? No, it's not. And also, you're talking about a little blip. No, not necessarily. Okay, you can blunt a glucose spike with fiber, another contraindication, so you'll just be doing yourself another disservice, okay? But you'll also still have a glucose increase. You will lessen the amount of damage induced by sugar. But how about you just don't consume it in the f first place, okay? Get rid of the enteric nervous system disrupting compound known as fiber, as well as the immune system dysregulating compound known as glucose. Oh, and fructose, and sucrose, and maltose, and galactose, and lactose, okay? How about we do that? But anyway, not indicated. Stop eating it consume a high glycemic index food like a tablespoon of sugar all okay so you just mentioned the glycemic index which is just complete nonsense glycemic index is based upon a fallacy that fallacy being that you can actually gauge what someone's glucose response will be blood glucose response will be to a given food on any given day let alone the same day actually because that varies depending on how much sleep the person got that night before their activity level that day the time of day okay just nonsense instead of looking at glycemic index why don't you just put down the f white powder known as glucose and sucrose just stop consuming it so but a 
Most foods that contain sugar also contain things like fat, protein, fiber, and all of those things help to lower the glycemic index. Okay, so what also helps to lower the glycemic index is not consuming sugar. Covered that. Also, fat and protein are contained within indicated and species-appropriate food for our species, such as red meat, for example. Abby, the food that we have evolved to eat and that our genes have withstood in terms of dietary input and therefore acclimated and adapted to for four and a half million years, if you include proto-humans that precede our current speciation, that being Homo sapiens sapiens. If you include our current speciation, 350,000. It's still quite a long time, isn't it, Abby? So like that peach we talked about is a really great example. Also, fiber isn't indicated. I already covered that. Check out my fiber playlist, please. There's only about three videos in there, but that's really all that there requires, honestly. But anyway. So like that peach we talked about is a really great example. And B, unless you're- Really? There's fat and protein in a peach? And B, unless you're Mary Poppins, most of us aren't having a spoonful of sugar all on its own. Well, not literally. Effectively, though, in uh, many cases, that is the case. Okay, you ever heard of ultra-processing? We are pairing it with other macros that lower the glycemic index. Okay, so you're upregulating the Randall cycle status of one's body, or at least encouraging one to do such a thing. That's great. Okay, the Randall cycle indicates unequivocally and unambiguously that one should not be mixing their macronutrients together to any significant degree. It indicates that you should be eating a diet that is rich in one of the macronutrients and very destitute in the other. Not necessarily completely absent, but effectively negligible amounts. Okay, and I'm about to record a video on that for a carnivore coach. Coach Peter, shout out to you. I'm about to record a lecture-like video on that very soon. So, look out for that one. I discussed in my video on continuous glucose monitors, the main short-term outcome of a blood sugar spike in someone with a healthy working pancreas is that it just doesn't feel so good, right? Like Abby, okay, first of all, why would you not want to feel good after eating? Okay, it's not normal to not feel good after eating something. It's an indication to you and your body that you shouldn't be consuming that thing ever again, or at least as seldomly as possible. Only consume it when it's absolutely necessary to do so. But also another oxymoron little phenomenon there, or a little phrase there. An insulin spike in a healthy working pancreas. I guess that's not oxymoronic, but your implication that it's totally fine and healthy to have an insulin spike is what is false here. You get a little tired, you get a little moody, maybe a little- Yeah, that's an indication that you shouldn't be consuming that food, isn't it? Two. Eat a Snickers. Better? Better. Yet, the internet loves to harp on the subsequent release of insulin as being inflammatory and fat storing. Nope. Okay, insulin is not inflammatory. I haven't heard anyone say that, Abby. Not once have I heard anyone say that. It is, however, fat storing. Yes, it is. By its very intrinsic nature. It doesn't mean that insulin above a certain level will necessarily cause someone to be obese or overweight. That's not what we say either. We just say that it's the most conducive to effectuating fat gain. And it is, okay? Our body is regulated by hormones, okay? They're signaling molecules, metaphorically. Well, not even really metaphorically. They are literally signaling molecules. Since I said literally, you must take what I just said as truth, as sacrosanct. Like discuss this ad nauseum on my channel here, but it's actually Don't I? not the release of insulin that influences health or body weight. Mm, that is actually, especially the latter. In terms of health, no, not necessarily. And we just covered that, didn't we? At least we touched on it briefly insulin resistance that influences health and calorie balance. Insulin resistance is not what influences health per se. Okay, insulin resistance isn't actually an illness itself. It is a physiological response that is completely indicated to employ and have present in someone that consumes glucose and fat together. In fact, that is the most auspicious approach to achieving an insulin resistant little scenario there via the Randall cycle phenomenon. Okay? The cross inhibition of fat and glucose within a cell, which actively lowers acetyl-CoA concentrations, which therefore subsequently necessarily decreases ATP concentration within a cell. And that necessarily involves a commensurate increase in inorganic phosphate and ADP, the former of which, if present in excess, will stimulate via phosphorylation pro-inflammatory cytokines. It will inflame a cell. This is why people eating a mixed macronutrient diet tend to get fatter and fatter over time and more inflamed. Okay? It's another reason why people that eliminate fat from their diet and consume only carbohydrates via a plant-based diet can also ameliorate their diabetes. Not as effectively as people on a carnivorous diet that is properly tenured or properly fortified, however, which is what I would really like to emphasize there and specify. But anyway, interesting. Then influences our body weight 
far more than sugar consumption alone. Well, so that's interesting. So even if you're going to use insulin resistance as a little model here that you just did in your video, it's interesting that you just said that insulin resistance is what actually influences fat storage. Because in an insulin resistant scenario, you have elevated insulin. So doesn't it go right back to insulin, Abby? I mean, I don't really understand what your point is here. I mean, I, I do know what it is. It doesn't matter if your insulin is elevated as long as you don't have insulin resistance because the insulin isn't chronically elevated. But still, the insulin in the scenario is still the thing causing fat gain. Bottom line, insulin is not the problem. It depends it on what you mean. Is it the problem with respect to fat storage? Well, yes, it is. But even then, insulin is not what you should go after. It's the thing stimulating the insulin that isn't necessary and actively damaging above a high enough concentration that is being consumed. That being sh sh sugar, uh, Abby, goodness. I mean, one of these things isn't necessary for the body, okay? Insulin is necessary to have in the body. Glucose, in terms of exogenous introduction and administration, is not. Anyway, covered that resistance is and we're gonna talk no we don't know what insulin resistance is please go ahead and explain what insulin resistance is abby go ahead a lot more about what that means in a hot minute yes yes please number two sugar causes chronic disease it can it can definitely exacerbate it so first of all it is true that uh, the inappropriate pretentiousness it's just so overbearing it's so brash it's it's inappropriate it's really something isn't it folks i mean i know that it's a personality on youtube so i'm not gonna harp on it too much it doesn't really bother me that much if i'm being honest it's youtube but goodness at least be right if you're gonna be sassy sorry it is true that excess sugar is consistently associated with everything from like obesity diabetes to cancer to liver disease to dementia to well it's funny that you mentioned cancer because actually cancer necessarily requires glucose administration up to forty thousand percent more glucose via the warburg effect in order to function that's interesting but also i wonder why sugar is associated with all these things to be fair i'm not really interested in associations per se not as much as other heart sciences like biochemistry but also look abby what is diabetes? Diabetes is explicitly and exclusively defined as chronically elevated blood glucose and nothing else, in fact. Okay? Why is diabetes deadly and dangerous? Well, because the precise molecule that is inducing damage is the glucose, as well as the fructose, just in other ways, actually. Well, <laughs> not in other ways. It's the same mechanism, 7 to 11 times more than glucose, actually. But it's just very inconspicuously done because, well, it is not processed the same way, so it doesn't stimulate a blood glucose increase mortality. But as with anything in the nutrition world, just because sugar consumption is associated with poor outcomes doesn't mean it directly or specifically causes it. That's interesting, Abby. It's interesting that you want to emphasize very sarcastically that association does not equate to causality. However, in other videos, you tend to completely perfunctorily dismiss that when it suits your narrative, which is in fact exactly what you do. Anyway. Influencers love to call out sugar as inflammatory. Because yeah, it is. It does induce inflammation. Inflammation, once again, is a pre-programmed response that occurs within the body when it has perceived damage to tissues and potential invading pathogen. Glucose above a certain indicated physiological level within the blood will induce damage to proteins like albumin and also the cells in which they are being oxidized if that concentration increases enough in a cell. But it does that by, once again, forming covalent bonds with those proteins and causing the protein to either work improperly or not work at all, which deranges the protein and causes the body to perceive it as a foreign protein. It happens with your LDL particles. People have often heard about that in the space, which launches inflammation because, once again, a potential invading pathogen. Well, there you go, foreign protein. And also, it is launched whenever there is perceived damage to tissues, which glucose, once again, causes via the mechanisms that I just elucidated. So it, once again, launches inflammation via a two-fold mechanism above a physiological level that is dependent on one's own personal physiology because of biodiversity. But if glucose, exogenous glucose, is not required, for human function and human physiology, and it can only induce harm, therefore, and also other things that aren't very aesthetically pleasing, like fat gain, in the wrong areas too, in the least aesthetically pleasing areas, well, why would you consume it then? It doesn't mean quit it overnight. That's a great way of going through hell for a few days, keto flu, but it does mean to wean yourself off of it because it is a recreational drug, Abby. <sighs> anyway, we'll get to it. They probably don't even really know what that means. But inflammation is not just looking puffy. No, I, I do know what inflammation means. Sorry, I almost didn't catch that. I do know what inflammation means. I just elucidated it, in fact. Inflammation is not just looking puffy or bloated. Correct. That is a symptom of it, sure. Or it can be one. Inflammation is just your body's response to a potential intruder. And um, or damage to tissues, Abby. <laughs> See how you left that part out, which is arguably the most salient one with respect to glucose? Anyway. Glycation. 
Acute inflammation isn't actually a concern. It's like... No mm, well, acute inflammation does become a concern when you have multiple sets of acute inflammation because then it's no longer acute, it's chronic. ...and natural, and it's actually a pretty important bodily process. It's essential, okay, because inflammation is the process by which the body heals itself from injury and also protects itself from invading pathogens. We already covered that, didn't we? However, inflammation itself, if chronic, will, will increase disease presentation propensity and also increase the severity of already present dysfunction, let's say. So, once again, we need to actually make that clear. And, and glucose is a great way, it's a very conducive way, the consumption of it, to effectuating such things and manifesting such things in the human body. Anyway. In fact, your body is technically in a state of inflammation after you work out. And that's because of the induction of injury to the tissues. Yes, we know this. That doesn't mean that you should just be arbitrarily inducing injury to you unnecessarily with things like glucose. We, we covered this, didn't we? It's the chronic inflammation that leads to disease. And the Right, and what is conducive to effectuating chronic inflammation within the body, Abby? What is the most conducive way to doing such a thing? Perhaps inducing acute inflammation chronically? On a quotidian basis? Jeez. Anyway, the effects of sucrose on metabolic health. Nope, not effects. Not effects, Abby. False. Okay. A systematic review. Okay, so a meta-analysis of human intervention studies. Okay. How long did the studies go on for? What was the demographic of people? In healthy adults. That's a construct and an opinion. Define healthy. That's an opinion. We systematically reviewed interventions substituting sucrose for other macronutrients in apparently healthy adults. Apparently healthy. Yeah, exactly. To assess impact on... No, not impact. On cardiometabolic risk indicators. Not risk either. These studies cannot inform upon risk. Whose risk? Mine? Now, there are no studies in inferential statistics to inform upon risk because risk is a cause and effect statement, and there are no studies to inform upon the risk of any heart health outcome or disease process as it relates to any aspect of human nutrition over any given period of time throughout the entire time human nutrition science has existed, or inferential statistics for that matter, because inferential statistics makes no claims about causality. Basic, 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 basic 101 statistics right there. Day one. Anyway, 25 studies, 29 papers, met inclusion criteria but varied in quality and duration, okay? Weaknesses included small subject numbers. Interesting, okay? Maybe six Signal to noise ratio, perhaps? Unclear reporting of allocation. Unusual dietary regimes. Define that. Differences in energy intake. That matters. Also, we don't intake energy, by the way. It's mass. But okay. Covered that in a Matt Walsh video recently. Fat composition or fiber between conditions. Uh, whatever. Sucrose substitution for starch up to 25% energy. Does not appear to have adver. Really? So sugar substitution for sugar consumption? up to 25%, so not even 100%, does not seem to have adverse effects on cardiometabolic risk factors. What the hell was this? Really? Wow. Anyway, we're done with this. We look at the hard sciences in this sphere. Biochemistry, human physiology, comparative anatomy, chemical anthropology, physics, chemistry, inferential anthropology as well, which actually gives us better inferences than this sh Anyway, I'm done with this. We know that glucose is toxic, okay? What is diabetes, Abby? Which clearly shows no direct impact of sugar on inflammation in individuals with healthy weight. No study will show a direct impact from any externality as that relates to any presentation. I covered that, didn't I? So let's consider an extreme population. You know, the athletes on the- Why? Why would we consider an extreme population? <laughs> now this definitely can't be extrapolated to normal people, the lay person. What the hell is this? We're consuming over 500 grams of sugar per day. And some- So? Runners are consuming well over 100 grams of sugar every day for years. So? Sugar was truly inflammatory and disease-causing all on its own. Well, it can be. However, these endurance athletes are using their muscles more, which means that the concentration of glucose in their cells that are being utilized, like their muscle cells, does not increase very much. So, if the influx of glucose is very high, but the outflux, so to speak, is also high, then the concentration of glucose within that cell won't be that high, which means it won't induce damage. Does that mean that they should be deriving their glucose from exogenous sources? No. Does that mean that their exercise is hedging against slightly, or maybe even significantly, the damage that can be incurred from glucose? Yes. But once again, just because a non-lethal dose of cyanide is non-lethal and can be found in some foods via industrialization, doesn't mean that cyanide is indicated to be consuming, even if that dose is non-lethal. It's common sense. Glucose is a toxin. Cyanide is a toxin. There is a non-lethal and non-deleterious dose of both of those. The dose makes the poison. The problem is that that dose varies person to person and neither of those two compounds are necessary for human consumption. <sighs> wow. I mean, Lane Norton is one of these people that says, well, the dose makes the poison. Okay, define the dose, Lane. What is the dose? Because that varies from person to person. Is glucose indicated to be consuming and necessary for human consumption? No. So why the hell would you be consuming it in the first place? Goodness, it really is something. These athletes would all be dying middle age. When it That's not true. 
It is a multifaceted issue. There are a myriad of factors to be considered here. In reality, endurance athletes have like the lowest levels of inflammation, lowest risk of diseases. And well, not risk. You can't inform upon risk with these studies. No, false. Okay. Diabetes and some of the longest life expectancies compared to, you know, other populations. Don't care. Covered that. Imagine how they would actually function and how long they would have lived and how much healthier they would have been if they weren't consuming glucose. What's your point? No, sugar itself is not causing inflammation or chronic disease. No, yes, it can, Abby. <laughs> what is diabetes? at play here is what we call a mediating factor, which basically explains the relationship between two things. Thank you for that. Between A and C. And in this case, if A is sugar and C is disease, the strongest mediator is believed to be excess weight. <sighs> What caused the excess weight, Abby? The transmutation of glucose into glycerol and new fatty acids via lipogenesis to create new triglycerides, thus to be stored necessarily when created into adipocytes and to a small extent, smaller extent, muscle cells and liver cells? What stimulates insulin? Well, protein, but good luck getting fat on protein and fat, okay? It was the f***ing sugar. Sugar causes marked increases in insulin and also increases appetite. Obesity itself doesn't really cause disease. It can exacerbate them if you get to a significant enough point because it does release inflammatory lipokines from adipose tissue in the stomach and it can cause a catch-22 situation where someone can maintain their fat stores for longer than they should be, really. It can cause some lag in fat loss. Anyway, this is... This is desperate. What caused the obesity, Abby? specifically excess visceral fat around the midsection. What caused the visceral and subcutaneous fat accumulation? Because that's the problem. Line. Sugar alone does not cause inflammation or disease. Yes, it can. We covered that, didn't we? Biodiversity makes it to where the dose is different for each person. But invariably, glucose is not necessary for people. There is a very fringe minority of people that do require some amount of exogenous glucose. Very little, though, still. I believe Sally K. Norton is one of these people. And it's because of metabolic damage in many cases from either oxalate toxicity, which is a thing, or liver damage. In the case of, I think, Jennifer Geisert, I believe? It seems to be the case that she needs some carbs in her diet because of liver problems that she had a while back. I don't know. It encourages excess weight gain, it can increase our risk. <sighs> Seriously, what causes the weight gain? Also, fat gain is what you mean, Abby, not weight gain. Okay, fat gain. It's caused by insulin. And what markedly stimulates insulin? Sugar. It also stimulates your dopamine receptors, it seems, seven to eight times more than cocaine. That study was shown in mice, and fair enough, if you don't want to derive your information from mouse and rat studies. That makes sense. I get it. But what we do know, it, it, you'd have to be a moron to believe that sugar isn't addictive. We do know that it does stimulate dopamine, but all food does. It just seems that sugar does it far more. Next, let's narrow in on the disease that's almost exclusively related or associated with sugar type 2 diabetes. Sugar is required for diabetes. Carbohydrate consumption is required for diabetes. Abby, I swear to you, I will bet all of my life savings that you will not find me someone that has type 2 diabetes that does not consume carbohydrates to some degree. You won't do it. You can't do it. It's not possible. Carbohydrates are required for the process. Diabetes, a disease characterized exclusively and explicitly as chronically elevated blood glucose and nothing else, is caused by, in terms of type 2 diabetes, carbohydrates consumption to some degree. There are other compounds that raise one's propensity for developing diabetes because of the induction of inflammation that it causes, seed oils being one, statins being another, actually, but you need carbohydrates for the process, exogenous ones. Well, again, there is absolutely a strong association between sugar consumption. Abby, sugar consumption is required for diabetes me. Yes, you can hedge against the development of diabetes while maintaining sugar consumption by engaging in exercise and many other things, actually. Exercise being a big one, though. Increase in muscle mass. Does that mean you should continue consuming it? And does that mean that you are hedging against completely the damage that is incurred and sustained from glucose consumption? No. I mean, this is amazing. Just, just pseudo sophistication here. Okay, Occam's razor, Abby and type 2 diabetes. But again, sugar cannot solely be to blame. Yes, it can, Abby. What the f*** is wrong with you? For one, type 2 diabetes is almost 50% hereditary. No. Oh, 
God. You will have genes that make you more predisposed, let's say, to developing diabetes at a lower sort of dose, let's say, regular dose of, of carbohydrate consumption. This goes for all genes. It, it goes back to what I just said, biodiversity, okay, via genetics. However, this little pleiotropy thing you're talking about, this myth that genes necessarily have an effect on one's physiology with respect to disease presentation, no. Genes are designed to encode for the production of a specific protein and nothing else, which means means that they can be activated, deactivated, or somewhere in the middle with respect to the development of such protein. Those genes respond to external stimuli, the environment in which you place them. Part of that environment being what you eat. So yes, genes can increase your propensity for developing a certain condition given the same stimulus or stimuli as compared to someone else that doesn't have your genes. That doesn't mean that they will necessarily develop that disease because of having those genes. For example, there are about 8 to 10 or maybe 11 genes that are required to be activated, that need to be activated for someone to develop cancer. They're called oncogenes. But someone can have all 11 of those genes and not develop cancer. One person could eat only sugars and not develop insulin resistance while someone else- Insulin resistance is not a pathology, but I get what you're saying. And yes, that's true, especially if they don't consume any fat. Goodness. I mean, I think we already covered this, folks. I, I really think we did might eat a really high protein keto diet their entire life and be predisposed. But they can be predisposed to developing it, but they won't develop it if they're not consuming sugar with respect to type 2 diabetes. And by the way, Abby, type 2 trends towards type 1 for a reason. Aside for a second, it really does come down to the mediators that we just discussed. So the main one here, as we discussed, is obesity, specifically. Ob obesity is a symptom of poor dietary input. The cause of diabetes is still the sugar, Abby. Whether you like that or not, whether I like that or not, I love sugar. Nom, 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 nom. Yum. Great. Awesome. I'm not going to consume it on a regular basis because it's going to kill me eventually, or at least vastly raise my chances of that and excess liver fat coupled with inactivity. No, those are associative factors, Abby. We already covered this, okay? I need a knife. To put it super simply. Cute, wow. If we are chronically consuming high glycemic index carbohydrates, we covered the glycemic index, okay? Stop focusing on the glycemic index. Stop focusing on, well, is this dose as poisonous as this dose? They're poisonous. Toxic leads to a caloric surplus or pain. You know, caloric surplus is hyperthermia because calories are units of heat energy, informally speaking, and the human body can uh, absorb and consume calories, those being photons of light when manifested in the real world. Okay, you don't consume calories. Your body doesn't yield calories from food. It doesn't yield energy from food, in fact, because E equals MC squared. You would be effulgent. You'd be coruscating if you yielded energy from food. It's broken down into smaller constituents of mass, and they engage and are involved in exothermic chemical reactions, which releases heat. So some calories are released in the form of body heat. The minority of the heat is encapsulated by the body to form ATP, and there you go. Okay, but we... <sighs> We're an open system, Abby. We exude mass in the forms of water vapor, carbon dioxide, bicarbonate, electrolytes, and urine, and we also emit calories. Okay, so stop talking about ca stop talking about calories. Okay, you can't f consume a calorie. You consume mass. Hormones don't have any effect on calories. Hormones have effect on mass. Okay, give me a f break has to work really, really hard to pump out insulin to bring our blood sugar levels back down. Okay, and what caused the blood sugar levels to be elevated? Was it overeating itself? Not necessarily. No, it's overeating carbohydrates. What is overeating carbohydrates? Consuming any amount above absolute zero. Okay. Surplus of calories and carbohydrates. Not calories. Covered that. F also, excess of carbohydrates. What is excess of carbohydrates, Abby? We covered that, didn't we? Just two seconds ago. We can essentially end up with very full glycogen stores and expanded fat stores, which pushes more carbs and fat to be stored around the organs like the liver. And will that happen if you're not consuming carbohydrates, Abby? An unnecessary and contraindicated nutrient for human consumption? Nutrient. Compound. Our liver can actually detect that blood glucose is there. It pumps out even more glucose into the bloodstream. So now your insulin levels are super high. Your blood glucose levels are also super high. What caused that, Abby? Does fat stimulate insulin in isolation? Effectively, no. Does protein? Yep. And the degree to which it initiates a glucose release, and therefore a subsequent insulin release, is dependent on the underlying glycemic status of the body, which means it depends on if you're consuming carbohydrates along with it. You can actually vastly increase your blood glucose response to protein if you consume it with carbohydrates, because the I to G ratio is highly dependent on the need for gluconeogenesis. Anyway, I mean, this is, this is amazing. Occam's razor. This is just bread and circuses. This is pseudo-sophistication and desperation here. This is what we've seen today, everyone. It's amazing.
your pancreas starts to poop out. I'm tired, boss. Well, not only does it start fatiguing, it seems as if the glucose itself starts to induce damage to the beta cells as well. Okay, cells can only continue dividing for so long, and at the rate at which they used to be dividing for so long, your body starts to slow down. Look into telomeres, Abby. And this is what causes diabetes. No, sugar consumption causes type 2 diabetes. We're done. Obfuscation. Dangerous, misinformed, ignorant, gullible, obsequious obfuscation here. I said, rarely does this happen without a caloric surplus and increase in body fat. What no, that's not true because a caloric surplus doesn't f***ing exist if you're not talking about and referring to hyperthermia produces metabolites that inhibit glucose uptake, so it makes it harder for insulin to do its job. Did You do realize, Abby, that when one consumes a ketogenic carnivorous diet, that the cells favor fat uptake, which prevents the cells from as efficiently and proficiently sequestering glucose from the bloodstream to oxidize, and also causes a downregulation of the production of GLUT4 transporters. GLUT4 is different from a lot of these other ones. These ones are generally insulin independent. In other words, they don't depend upon the concentration of insulin for their amount. GLUT4 is insulin dependent. That means when insulin is present, he can help to be able to increase the number of GLUT4 transporters or increase the efficiency of the GLUT4 transporters. The very transporter that glucose is involved in being administered into in order to enter the cell, necessarily it has to enter that transporter. Both of those things cause what's called physiological insulin resistance, you do realize that that also prevents people from uptaking as much glucose. So that means that I am physiologically insulin resistant. The myth here that you're implying is that insulin resistance is a pathology. That is indicated. Should you be insulin resistant with respect to what's colloquially deemed the pathological version? No, but you don't fix the insulin resistance. That's like fixing a fever when someone is sick. You fix the problem. The problem is glucose consumption. The problem is not fat consumption because fat is a necessary nutrient to consume. It is required. There are certain necessary essential fatty acids. There are essential amino acids. There are no essential exogenous carbohydrates. We're done, Abby. For inactivity and just like not moving your body. And this is why we see in studies where- Cover that. Calories are controlled and there's no- You can't control calories, okay? You can only control the intake of calories at zero for people. Change in body composition or body weight. We actually don't see the link between sugar intake and diabetes risk. Oh my God, not risk and not link either. Link very seldomly is used to describe associations, okay? It's not a good word to be using either way, but we know exactly what you mean by link. So, bottom line, sugar consumption does not cause diabetes. Can you believe this, folks? The pseudo-sophistication, the obfuscation, and also I used the word obsequious just now, obedient or attentive to an excessive or servile degree. I'm calling her this as well as all dietitians because they're just parroting what they're told <laughs> by the authorities. Look up lickspittle as well. That's a good one. If we were to take genetics out of the equation for a moment. Yes, please sugar consumption coupled with obesity specific what caused the obesity Abby? <laughs> find me someone that became obese by not consuming carbohydrates as well as seed oils actually by the way but mainly actually carbohydrates believe it or not you'll struggle high visceral and liver fat plus inactivity is more specifically what increases the risk okay those can increase one's propensity for developing it because inflammation lowers redox potential it disallows the cell from being able to sequester excess glucose from the bloodstream or as much glucose from the bloodstream as it otherwise could if it weren't inflamed and did have an optimal redox potential which is influenced and dictated actually by the nad to nadh ratio and the atp concentration within a cell all that nonsense well not nonsense all that important sh and seed oils will induce the inflammation statins will induce the inflammation markedly okay but at the end of the day what is the thing inducing the damage okay it's the sugar what's causing the marked and very frequent insulin responses. Okay, it's the carbohydrates. Goodness me, Abby. A pretentious display, an arrogant display, and an ignorant one. It's amazing, Abby. If you're an athlete living off those glucose gels throughout your intense training sessions, don't do that. Insulin sensitivity is probably- Insulin sensitivity is another construct. It's the yang to the yin that is insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is also a construct. It's an idea. It is put forth as a pathology, therefore. And that is the problem, which is why we should just stop saying the words insulin resistance in the first place. Okay, it's carbohydrate consumption that's the problem. That's fine. So now let's zone in on that mediating factor and talk about the fear that sugar causes obesity. So- <sighs> me, here we go. I thought we were done. 
first of all, like diabetes, obesity is incredibly hereditary. It's okay, once again with the genetics argument. It can make someone more predisposed to developing an overweight and obese status given the same stimulus or stimuli as compared to someone else that doesn't have that genetic predisposition. But they are not a fait accompli. Genes are not and never have been. They are all activated, deactivated, or somewhere in between with respect to the environment in which you place them around 40 to 70 percent. That said, there's loads of data linking sugar consumption to weight gain, but there are even a lot of- Oh my god, stop looking at inferential statistics. Okay, look at human physiology. Carbohydrate consumption raises insulin, spikes it in fact because it spikes blood glucose. It stimulates your dopamine receptors more than cocaine, it seems. Okay, it causes people to overeat. So if you even want to talk about caloric surplus as a, as a construct and a model, well, best way to actually achieve that is by consuming carbohydrates, so there you go. <laughs> Insulin is required for fat storage. Insulin itself actually is a hormonal regulator for the four enzymes involved in triglyceride synthesis by raising its Vmax and Km value. That's biochemistry though, Abby. Insulin is required for fatty acid synthesis actually, by the way. The creation of new fatty acids from glucose. Well, not really from glucose actually. It's from excess ATP, citrate goes to the cytosol, split into acetyl-CoA and malate. Acetyl-CoA is then converted into malonyl-CoA, and malonyl-CoA is the backbone for fatty acid synthesis, actually. But insulin is required to stimulate phosphoprotein phosphatases in the cell to actually effectuate that process, to activate acetyl-CoA carboxylase, the enzyme required and involved in the synthesis of the chain lengthening process. So insulin comes over here, and it binds onto this receptor. It leads to the activation of these molecules, which are called phosphoprotein phosphatases. So now imagine that this guy has phosphates on him, and he's inactive. If we want to activate him, then we have to bring in those other molecules, phosphoprotein phosphatase. That's physiology though, Abby steps involved here as well. So refined sugars and other refined carbohydrates are rapidly digested and absorbed so they don't keep you feeling full very long. Abby, once again with this whole blunt the glucose spike, stop eating the glucose. Is this going to be my video? I really hate for this to be my video because I'd like to entertain people more. I'd like to give some more information out. However, I'm finding it very difficult to get anything else out but Occam's razor. Then, of course, we find ourselves hungry again soon after, which- I wonder why. Perhaps postprandial hypoglycemia inducing, well, hunger, among other things as well? Dizziness? Shakiness? Headaches? Something that is not indicated for human physiology? You're not supposed to feel like that after you go without food for three hours or so. This whole three meals a day with snacks in between nonsense is killing people. And so we need to eat more calories over the course- Not calories. And this is why my hunger question combo recommends dressing up naked carbs with a source of fiber, protein, and fat. Right, so a mixed meal, which is the most dangerous meal one can consume. It's more dangerous than a vegan meal. I will debate people on that. It is more damaging than a vegan meal slow down that nutrient absorption and to support satiety. And this would explain- You know what supports satiety is the fat and protein, Abby. A great way to overeat fat and protein is by mixing it with carbs. F*** me, you ever heard of the meat sweats? It's not really the meat, it's the carbs with the meat. We don't see an association with sugar consumption from whole foods that contain sugar like fruit or dairy where those sugars are bound up with hunger crushing compounds. In fact, the- Really, Abby? Suggest the exact opposite. It's also worth noting that non-sugar foods like refined grains or processed meats or fried foods like french fries, as well as just not exercising, are just as much associated with weight gain as sugar is. So what? I'm not saying that those things should be consumed. Processed meats define that though, by the way. Everything's processed. Okay, but... <laughs> Obesity is most conducively achieved by consuming a mixed diet of fat and glucose together in significant quantities, especially if that fat is seed oils, by the way. Oh my gosh. Talk about banal. Talk about trite. I'm boring myself. My apologies, everyone. Seriously. If you stuck around this long, props to you. Seriously. And there's another piece to this puzzle. So often foods that are high in refined sugars are also high in fat and or salt. And this unique mixture of sugar and fat not only makes for an even higher calorie food, but it also evolutes- Not calories has been shown to be extra rewarding to our brains. No, uh, it's been speculated to be an evolutionary reward signal, and I believe it. How about this, Abby? Try and eat a stick of butter, or at least a significant amount of it, and see how much you get down. And then add some honey on top of it. And then you tell me how much you can get down. Basically, because the carbs are the addicting thing. Then try the honey in isolation and see how much you get down. You'll get a ton of that down too. Foods contribute to like a high calorie to low satiety ratio. Not calorie. And I'm about tired of hearing this word. 
but also because they're so rewarding to our dopamine levels, they're more likely to be overconsumed. Okay, look at this table. Chocolate, fat and carbohydrate. Ice cream, fat and carbohydrate. French fries, fat and carbohydrate. Pizza, fat and carbohydrate. Cookie, fat and carbohydrate. Chips, fat and carbohydrate. Cake, fat and carbohydrate. Popcorn, fat and carbohydrates. Cheeseburger, fat and carbohydrates. Muffin, fat and carbohydrates. So she's putting this up to prove her point that things with fat and carbohydrates in them are more addicting. This is proving my point that if you take the sugar out of all of these things and try to eat it, I mean, has anyone tried 100% dark chocolate, like the baking bar of dark chocolate? Go ahead and try that. Try to eat that. See how much you get down. Take the sugar out of a muffin. Well, you can't actually because the muffin is carbs. Take the bun off the cheeseburger. You don't need me to tell you that. So I don't need you to tell me anything. Neither do I want you to. Fine. If we consider these simple mechanisms, it's not enough to say that sugar causes obesity. We Maybe not in isolation, but even if it is in a multifaceted little tapestry, you could say sugar, this is just my opinion, but given how human physiology works and how much I know about it already, sugar would be the primary culprit. Covered that though say that high sugar intake leads to low fullness at meals and higher dopamine release, which leads- And higher insulin release and higher blood glucose release, blood glucose being transmitted directly into fatty acids and glycerol to form triglycerides to store into adipocytes and muscle cells, and insulin increasing the Vmax and KM, and therefore the upregulation of triglyceride synthesis enzymes, okay? To higher calorie intake, which- Not calorie intake. Leads to an increased risk of obesity, which- Nonsense, Abby, because you can't consume calories. Obesity is a hormonal dysregulation issue. Prove me wrong. Increases the risk of inflammation and disease. See, we gotta bring this all full circle here. And yeah, and you get it completely wrong. So great job. This is the paradigm, the paragon of health here, Abby Sharp. I'm not pretending like if you don't consume sufficient food for your needs that you won't lose weight. You probably will, you'll, you'll be on that train. I already covered this in the Matt Walsh video I did recently. Check that out, please. Seems to be doing pretty well. Speaking of full circle, is sugar really as toxic as they say? Well, who's they? Because I'm just saying that it's toxic. It's toxicity per unit of glucose depends highly on biodiversity. In a vacuum, no. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Straight up sugar is never gonna be like a superfood. It's got low nutrient density and a poor satiety profile. Its main selling feature is that it's delicious and it brings us joy. But then okay, so it's a recreational drug. Oh man, once you start really opening your eyes to the fact that these things are recreational drugs, then this rhetoric really starts to be disturbing and this type of behavior. I mean, you wanna talk about continuous blood glucose monitoring as being the new eating disorder. The eating disorder most prevalent today is the carbohydrate consumption. Debate me on it. Doesn't mean that it's It is poison, by the way. As with anything, context is really important. So okay, but we already covered the context. We covered everything here. What you've done is you've added inappropriate context and irrelevant context in order to pseudo sophisticate and obfuscate things and effectuate other people's perception of your knowledge and intelligence. Well, sorry, that didn't work on me. We have to consider how much are we eating? What are we eating? Is it anything above absolute zero? Because that means that, well, it's not indicated and it does raise your propensity for storing onto excess fat, probably. And like, how is it affecting our overall energy balance and our body weight? So here- Not energy balance, mass balance actually, heavy. Evidence-based suggestions for managing your sugar intake. Number one, let's talk how much. So- Since she said evidence-based, that means that it's gonna be correct because she said the word evidence. Currently, the guidelines suggest no more than 10% of calorie intake should be coming from added sugars. Not calorie intake, and also added sugars. There you go. So all natural sugars are totally fine, even though the molecules are the exact same. Good. Yeah, because that makes sense. Occam's razor once again, actually, everyone. Diet. For most people, that's around one and a half cans of soda, or a slice of cake, or one and- Along with all of the other fruit and all the other natural sugars that one consumes, as if they're any different. It's amazing chocolate bars. This does not include whole food sources like- Yeah, exactly. And that's the problem. <laughs> wow. From fruit or dairy, which again, as we talked about, are bound up with blood sugar regulating compounds. Next- No, if anything, it causes more inflammation. Okay. And also it can increase a blood glucose response and it can also increase its length of presentation and existence in the blood at an elevated level need to think about what we're eating it with. And this is where- my No, you don't need to be thinking about what you're eating it with. Carbohydrates are contraindicated. You don't eat them. End of discussion. Hmm. If I eat cyanide in isolation, it's going to kill me. But if I can find a way to consume it without, I don't know, myself, that's the best thing to do. No. Crushing combo comes in. So pairing my- Look at the rando cycle, Abby, and then learn how to interpret it. Best way to learn how to interpret it is listen to my rhetoric and watch my videos.
chips with some Greek yogurt, some hemp parts, some coconut, some fruit in there, fiber, protein, healthy fats. Not only does this make for a more satiating snack or dessert that you have contraindicated carbohydrates, contraindicated fiber. Dairy itself is also, for all intents and purposes, a contraindication, just nowhere near the degree or to the degree that plants are, especially if the dairy has carbs in it, but it also has morphine in it. It's addicting. The only way to overeat on steak and meat, protein and fat from animal sources is by either pairing it with something sweet, pairing it with carbohydrates like bread, potatoes, pasta, or I should add putting a load of cheese on it helps to edge out the portion size of the chocolate, but it also helps to control the blood sugar response. And finally, how is it affecting our body weight and physical activity levels? If we covered that, didn't we? Suggestion one and two, this piece typically falls into place. But as I've talked about, excess visceral body fat and inactivity are far better predictors of insulin resistance than the sugar that you eat. It's no, sorry, predictor is not the best word to use there. But you know what, let's just use that word. Let's say it's, it's a predictor. It's still an association. And also insulin resistance is still a construct. I covered that. So if- Rewind my video engaging in daily physical activity and keeping a nutrient-dense energy balanced diet, we are less likely to find that to be putting ourselves at risk. So I hope this helps. Okay, you're likely to put yourself at lower risk necessarily and at zero risk from the abstention of carbohydrate consumption with respect to things like diabetes development, especially, but also probably obesity and an overweight status. Okay, if you're a normal functioning person, so. so I hope this helps to tone down some of the anxiety that you might have. Well, this helped with perpetuating misinformation. That's what it helped with. You've put more work on my plate because this is my job now, basically. I mean, thanks for that, I guess. You do give me content, but in an ideal world, you would not be making these videos. You would sit down and stop talking about nutrition, okay? And you'd also learn to exhibit humility. Humble yourself, Abby. Seriously, it's ridiculous around sugar consumption. I didn't want to get into sugar addiction because I have a whole other video covering that. Is sugar addiction real? The evidence on food addiction plus how to stop it? Yes, it is real. Food addiction is sugar addiction, basically. I mean, but I do acknowledge that for some people, having a little bit of sugar in the house or in the diet can be a slippery slope. But oh, there you go. If you're able to enjoy in moderation, I app- Okay, so next time I see an alcoholic, I'll tell them to moderate their whiskey instead of completely getting rid of it. Moderate their beer, or moderate their vodka, their spirits. Seriously, Abby, moderate- that, that's, the, that's the most hilarious argument I've ever heard. Moderate a recreational drug. Go ahead see nothing wrong with a regular treat. And well, of course you don't. And and here, here's the thing, a regular treat is fine. But yes, it's just like she said, it's a slippery slope. And so the best thing is just to not do that ever. Again, a big thank you to Eric Williamson for all of his- Thank you, Eric Williamson, for getting this woman to believe that she is remotely competent to speak upon the area of human nutrition because she has the initials RD after her name. Oh, wait, you also do. So thank you for also viewing yourself as remotely competent to speak upon this topic and also to deliver information to this woman that you believe to be indicated. Thank you very much. Really, I should be actually thanking you both for once again giving me content to react to. Thank you for that, because I, I get paid for that video and the research i'm going to be linking to his social media and website below thanks again to merge restaurant for all right this is just nonsense okay we're done well um that was atrocious i hope you guys understand that dietitians know nothing about anything except how to espouse propaganda that is all they know how to do please never listen to a word of abby sharp unless it's on one of these videos my videos so with that being said if you enjoyed the video please leave a like please subscribe to the channel please leave your thoughts in the comment section below also once again subscribe to the patreon if you haven't already to gain access to all the things i listed in the beginning and also buy my book contraindicated a closer look and revision of mainstream health axioms that have perpetuated illness disorder and disease for over a century as well if you haven't already and also most importantly the link on the bottom of the screen what is that there's a link that will bring you to an amazing site with amazing products from an amazing brand known as Cerule. If you purchase product through that link, you will get a permanent 10% discount and a permanent free shipping discount when signing up for monthly deliveries. If you want to know more about those products, which of course I recommend everyone do before buying anything, actually, I would refer to the link in the top right corner of the screen, the Cerule products link, which is a complete elucidation and a complete explanation of those products, what they do, who should take them, why you should take them, when to take them, etc, etc. And I would also further migrate to the description below to find an interview between myself and Professor Bart K on these products and the business of Cerule itself. Also, if you'd like to donate one-time donations instead of spending recurring payments through Patreon or Cerule, I do have one-time donation platform options in the description below via GoFundMe and PayPal, so I've left that option open for you guys. And also, email me at edgookie 14 at gmail.com if you have any questions about literally anything, such as how to earn your Cerule products for free, because who in their right mind wouldn't want that? So, with that being said, join me next time when we react to someone else once again that is, well, ignorant. So, till then. Anyone had ice cream without sugar in it? Well, you can't really do that because cream...
They're after me. It's about time. It's the government. They don't like the uh, anti-car rhetoric. Technically, is the government, though, right? Was that an ambulance or was that the police? Or was that a fire truck? I don't know the difference between the, the sirens. Anyway. Every Monday. Every Monday. I have to deal with this every Monday. I can't record on any other day, though. It disrupts the schedule. 10.13. It started at 10 o'clock. No, just keep going. No way. Are you serious right now? Quiet. We are left. <sighs> no, go on. Keep trucking through. Go on. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Mm hmm. Arbitrarily decide when you're going to start mowing. Make it Mondays, 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 and then the week that I don't record, make it a Wednesday. 